But I've got a song to sing It might not be on key But it's from my heart No one else can tell What the Lord has done for me This is my turn called day So I better start Somebody praise him in this place. Give him the glory that is due in this place. Hallelujah! Oh, Lord, we love you. I 
don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that greater is he that lives in us than he that's in the world. We have been given power to trample over scorpions and over all of the deadly things of the enemy. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. One, two, three.
altars are open for anybody needs the same thing this morning. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your
you become his little children amen <laughs> praise God this morning uh, this past week come of you know sometimes you can tell that you're doing the right thing because the enemy fights it tooth and nail Sometimes we think if we're doing the right thing, everything will go easy, but actually it's oftentimes the opposite, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But how many of you know that no weapon formed against us will prosper? Yeah. Amen. And even though it comes like a roaring lion, he says, resist him steadfast in faith. And he says that when you resist him, the enemy will flee from you. He says, past week, I wasn't feeling well. I got a hold of another wonderful minister that I know. And, and then he ended up coming down sick. But during that time, also my brother and friend Gene Thorne had been sick, but he was getting better. And so Pastor Gene is going to share this morning. I'm even know the devil's the all-time loser. <laughs> Bless you, brother. We love you. Cornerstone, can you please make Pastor Gene Thorne welcome this morning? <laughs> it's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Last weekend I had zero voice, none, period. Then I started croaking like a frog that was like a far away frog. No volume, just a far away frog. And slowly this week I've got my voice back and I hope and pray that I can keep it uh, to the end of today uh, because croaking frogs aren't all that great. So, <laughs> well, it's a privilege to be able to speak this morning. Um, I never take that lightly. Um, I go before the Lord and I ask Him to give me the words that He would have for the day. And I tell you what, that's what you want. You want the words from the Lord. You don't want the words from me. You don't want the words from any any preacher, you want the words from the Lord through the preacher. So, Lord, do your thing today. Holy Spirit, do your work today. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I tell you what, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst of them. He's here this morning. He's here to minister this morning. And I tell you what, the topic this morning uh, is going to touch each and every one of us because we're the same in this respect. Every single one of us is, has been, and will be broken. There's three requirements for revival. God is waiting for us to get everything lined up and right. Surrender repentance, and brokenness. Yeah, we're pretty good at saying that we've repented. Yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty good at saying we have repented. But real repentance is to not do that sin again. It's to put it aside. Real surrender is to give it to the Lord. Give it all to the Lord. I tell you what, if you're not broken right now, you're, you're sitting on the top of the mountain. 
If you're broken right now, you're down in the valley. And guess what? This life will bring you both in a cyclic manner. If you're not there right now, you're going to be. You're one moment away. You're one crisis away from being broken. You're one person dying in your family away from being broken. You're one health issue away from being broken. Yeah, you're one thing at work away from being broken. I'm telling you what, you can go one day with a great supervisor and they can retire and replace them with a body double of the devil. <laughs> I'm serious. They got Tasmanian devil blood running through their veins. And your world is turned upside down instantly. I've been there, man. I have been there. I'm telling you, things can change in a heartbeat. And you can become broken. And there is thousands of ways for life to break you. Now, there's a difference between being broken by the world and being broken by God. Listen, to get to revival, to get to the place where we're whole in our life, where we're receiving everything that God has for us, we've got to be broken by God. And that's where we're at today. Today is Super Bowl Sunday, and I tell you what, on my scale of, of things that really matter, and I played football when I was growing up, and, and I loved, I was there uh, glued to the TV for the very first Super Bowl between the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs. And I was a Packers fan. Bart Starr was the quarterback. Vince Lombardi was the coach. And, and, and like, I was right in the midst of playing football back then as I was growing up. And, like, they were my team. And they won the first three Super Bowls, by the way. And uh, today, the Kansas City Chiefs, who were the enemy back then, is playing in the Super Bowl. The Philadelphia Eagles are playing in the Super Bowl. Like I said, <laughs> on the scale of things, like Chinese balloons over the United States taking pictures of our military side, that, that's, that's pretty up there. Uh, who wins the Super Bowl? You know what? The sun is going to come up tomorrow morning. It is. It is. No matter who wins. But I'm going to tell you, there is one city going to be broken today. There are two teams going to meet on a field today. And I'll bet you in this room there's Kansas City fans and there is... Philadelphia fans, and that's great. They're both really good teams or they wouldn't be there in the Super Bowl. And I tell you what, it, when you throw two really good teams like that, you can make all the predictions you want, and it does not always go how you think. And life is that way. Life is that way. It does not always go how we plan. It does not always go how we think. But there's going to be one team one city that's broken. There won't be any Super Bowl parties in that, that city tonight. The other one, they'll be whooping it up. And if it was Morgantown, they'd be burning couches. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they're going to be on top of the world today. Yeah. That Super Bowl food is going to taste better than them today. It is. Yeah, things are going to happen for one team. They're going to put a Super Bowl ring on all those guys' fingers. And if you think the other team's not broken, you just ask the guy that didn't get the Super Bowl ring today. This is always going to be a day that lives in their memory for the rest of their lives. What they could have done to have changed the outcourse of this game today. Guarantee you, 20 years from now, they're going to still be thinking back on this day today. Because their life changed in a moment. Not important. It really isn't important. But boy, some things that happen to us really are important. 
and they will break you. You know, I've been around a lot of people in my life, and there's a certain set of people, especially guys, who are like, man, I am a self-made man. I have got it going on. I have done it. I have built up this business, and you know, and I've got some wealth, and, and I did it all myself, and you know, and they're they're very prideful about the fact that they're not broken. They're on top of it. They got it going. Well, I guarantee you that life will break you in some way, shape, or form, and it'll break that person. If not the fact that at their very last breath, they can't draw another breath, that alone will break you right there because you're going to meet eternity. You're going to meet the, the total consequence of what your life has really been up to that point. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior or don't you? I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. But there's so many other things that can break you in life, and it can come along any day. I don't want to be a pessimist. I, I, I really believe that, that uh, we need to have faith in God, that he's blessing us, that we're going to get the best out of this life and, and everything. But I'm telling you what, we're living in a world that has fallen. And things don't always happen the way that, that, that we want. Relationships take two people. You can have a relationship go wrong in a heartbeat and, and not be at fault at all yourself. It just is what it is. And you gotta, you got to take it and you got to roll with it and you got to go with it. It's tough. Life is tough. Life is tough a lot of times. Yeah, life is great a lot of times too, but life can be tough. And things in life can get a hook in you and a hold in you. Alcohol, drugs, illicit sex. I mean, the list just goes on and on of what Satan uses as a tool to break us. The Bible tells us that he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy and he will do that with your life in any way that he possibly can. And he will break you down. That's his goal, to break you down and make you miss heaven. He, he, knows, he knows in his heart of hearts he's going to hell. And he wants to take as many people as he can with him. That's his bottom line. I'm telling you, brokenness. Brokenness, brokenness can be something that keeps you down or it can be something that elevates you, elevates you into the presence of God. Depends on who breaks you down. The sat Satan's going to want to break you down and the world will break you down. But I'll tell you what, God has another plan. God has another plan. God has another plan, and it starts with surrender. You surrender your life to God, and then you repent. You start going another way, and it's important to do that every single day. Listen, repentance is not a one-time thing. I went to the altar, and I repented. I'm telling you what, you got to do that every day. You got to examine your life. If there's anything that comes in your life that is sin, you got to root it out, get it out. You got to go a different way. And you got to keep doing that. You got to keep that relationship with the Lord fresh in your life. But I'll tell you what, you've got to be broken. All the men of God that we read about in the Bible, were broken in some manner. Uh, I mean, there's a whole list of them. Uh, and God uses broken things. I tell you what, we break ground when we want to grow something. You know, you'll be breaking ground this spring if you're a farmer or if you're a gardener. That corn 
doesn't get there by itself. You break the ground. You put the seed in the ground. You water it. You fertilize it. And it grows and it produces corn. The same for tomatoes and pumpkins and squash and everything in a garden. Breaking ground is part of that. Broken clouds cause the rain to fall. God uses broken things even in nature. We break grain to make bread. You ever make bread out of whole grains? Now, it's, it's pretty good if you, like, put it in there a little bit, but, like, you don't want to eat a, a, a loaf of bread made with wheat that's not been ground and cracked and broken. I mean, it's just nasty. <laughs> We have to break bread to give us strength. Jesus himself, he broke bread and he gave it to his disciples. And we do the same thing in remembrance of him. And he uses broken people to do good things. Yep, brokenness uh, feels like the world has shaken you to the core. And you're not sure how you can put it all back together again. Ever been there? You just don't know how you can put it back together again. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Humpty Dumpty fell off of a wall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But I'm going to tell you, I know one who can. The king. The king. The king, Jesus, can put your life back together again when it's broken. Woo! Yes! You know, it's, it's tough when you look around and you see other people functioning just fine. You know, we're really good at putting on a happy face. It might have happened to you when you came to church this morning. The kids were squalling in the vehicle and you're yelling at them and then you pull in the parking lot and you go, everybody straighten up, put on your happy face here. We got to go in. Don't let the preacher see you like that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're all there. We're all human. We're all human and we're all broken. We're all imperfect. But God is perfecting us. Jesus Christ is working in your life and in mine. He is perfecting us. He's taken that broken life, and he's like a potter. It might be a lump of clay down there, but he brings it back up, and he forms it. And if there's a crack, he smooths it out. And that's what he's doing in your life and in mine today. Yep. All those thoughts that we have muddled up can be very overwhelming. Because life throws all kinds of curves at us. You know, when you're truly broken, the tears roll. You can't help it. I don't, I don't care if you're a man or not. You get really broken, the tears are going to roll. And I tell you what, when God breaks me, look out, because I'm going I'm to wash the place with tears. Yeah. I can't help it. I can't help it. When God sits down with me and gives me a message, and I'm crying when I'm putting it together, look out. Look out because the Holy Spirit is going to show up. I know because he uses tears. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he bottles our tears. They're that precious to him. He has every tear that you've ever shed bottled. Yeah, your tears are precious to him. Wow, God's used imperfect people throughout all time. Abraham, he was old, and he did not follow God's plan for a son. He got it wrong. We're, we're, we're all still paying for that in this world today. <laughs> Elijah, man, he was on top of it. And the next minute, he's crawling in a cave, and he's suicidal. Yeah. Joseph, he was abused and sold into slavery by his own brothers. His family 
mistreated him in the biggest way. Job, he went bankrupt. He lost his family, lost his health, had his wife and his friends turn on him. Talk about feeling alone. Talk about feeling that life has dumped on you. <laughs> Read Job and compare yourself to it. Whew, man, Moses had a speech problem and he murdered a guy. Yeah. Gideon, he was afraid. Samson, he was a womanizer. Rahab, she was a prostitute. David, he was an adulterer and a murderer. Peter was prone to anger and violence and denied the Lord three times. Jacob, Jacob's the one I want to settle in on a minute. Jacob, his very name means the deceiver. The deceiver. His own brother, his own flesh and blood brother, he stole his birthright. And then he conned his dad into giving him the blessing. This guy was a deceiver. Man, this guy should have worked in a used parking, used uh, car lot. <laughs> and his name should have been Sneaky Jacob. Seriously. Well, maybe he did have a used cam a lot. I don't know. <laughs> but Jacob, his very name meant deceiver. Whew. Abraham begot Isaac, begot Jacob. He's third in the line to, I will make the people come out of you that's like the stars in the sky. He's in the lineage of Abraham. He's third in the lineage. Jacob. And he's messed up. He is broken. He is broken. I want to read Genesis 32, 22 through 32. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man, capital M, wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he, capital he, saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. I want to tell you, he didn't let go, though. He was wrestling with the Lord, and he wouldn't let go. You know, and that's where real brokenness can bring you to is when... You throw yourself at the Lord's feet and you grab the hem of his garment. You wash his feet with your tears and wipe them with your hair and you will not let go. You will not let go. That's where brokenness can bring you to. Whew. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said... I will not let you go unless you bless me. You know, the world's trying to tear you away from the feet of Jesus. You come to this altar, oh, the devil's mad. The devil's mad. He wants to tear you away from the feet of Jesus. And he'll start on you as soon as you walk out that door. That's why. You have to grab hold and say, I'm not letting go. 
I'm not letting go. I'm a bulldog for Jesus. I'm not letting go. Woo. Mm. So he said to him, what is your name? Man, my name is a deceiver. Whew. He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. But Israel, Israel, he changed his name from deceiver to the one that was over Israel. Yeah, and that's what he'll do for you. You get broken and you grab hold of Jesus. And he will change you. You know, we live in a throwaway society. We really do. That microwave's not working. We don't fix it. We tear it out, throw it away, go down to Lowe's and buy another one. We do. Everything in our society, well, everything rusts, busts, and collects dust. Do you know that? Everything. When it gets a little bit of that rust on it and busts, out with it. And that's what the world will do to you, too. You get a little bit marred, a little bit scuffed, a little bit broken. What's the world want to do? Throw you away. Yeah, lock the key in the lock and forget about you. That's what the world wants to do. But guess what? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ loves you. He went to the cross for you. Yeah. If you think he cares about the songbirds, and he does, how much more does he care about you? How much more does he care about you? I like birds. I go out and feed them all the time. And we got two squirrels there that come and they turn the bird feeder upside down and rob all the seed out of it and eat the suet and whatever. And Sandy said, well, I like squirrels. They can have, have some too. You know what I wanted to do with them, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Squirrel pot pie. That's what I had in mind. The season's still in. But I care about the birds. I don't care about the birds near as much as the Lord cares about birds and even more about you. He loves you. Settle that here this morning. There's been times in my life I thought God was after me. I wanted to blame it on God. God, yeah, you've been after me. No, it wasn't him that was after me. It was that guy that used to play music in his court. That's who was really after me. And he's a liar. He's a liar. He's the father of all lies. If anybody is telling you that God has his thumb on you, that God is ready to smack you with a hammer, it's a lie. It's a lie. He sent his son to a cross for you. He loves you. Wow. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men. Did you notice? With God and with men. Because the world is breaking you, but God He's the one that will really break you and make you whole at the same time. He'll break you but make you whole at the same time. Yeah. He does something with your life from that point on. Whew. Some of the most anointed men that I have ever been around at one point in their life were the most broken men when you start looking at, at, at their history and their life. Yeah. God uses brokenness. Yeah. yeah. 
Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. The rest of his days, Jacob limped. And that limp reminded him, I have had an encounter with God. And you may be limping today too from some brokenness in your life. But I guess God has that in control. You're limping because he touched you. He touched you. He touched you. He touched you. And if you're right on the precipice of needing brokenness from God in your life, you don't have to leave here today in that state. This is where you can receive brokenness from God. Run to him. Run to him. Run to him. Run to him. Grab the hem of his garment. Grab the hem of his garment. Wash his feet with your tears and wipe them clean with your hair. Yeah. The ones that did that, they were very broken. The woman at the well was very broken. But he made her whole. He made her whole. The power of brokenness is never weakness. The world's going to tell you, hide that stuff. You don't want to appear weak in front of people. Yeah. Devil says that all the time. Don't appear weak in front of people. I tell you what, he's a liar. When I am weak, I am strong. When I am weak, I am strong. Yeah. You come through places of brokenness to a better place with God. To a better place. Whew. Through brokenness, we comprehend that we are finite people in tremendous need of a Savior. We can't do it on our own. I can't do it on my own. You can't do it on your own. We need a Savior. Listen, I messed my life up. I couldn't fix it. I was like Humpty Dumpty laying there at the foot of the wall all broken, knowing that I had messed up. But God, Pick me up. Yeah. And he'll do it for you too. He'll do it for you too. Yeah, broken by God and broken by the world is two different things. You know, people who feel emotionally broken, they exhibit that. They exhibit that. Low self esteem, they tend to be unhappy. You know, if you're around somebody at work and they're always unhappy, there's a reason for that. They're broken. They're broken. You know, hurt people hurt people. <laughs> That's the way it is. That's the way it works because they're broken and they lash out over it. They feel hopeless. Or in despair. This is not how God sees you. He does not see you that way. He sees you in a restored way. He sees what your potential is. He sees what the place you can come to. He sees the use that you can be for the kingdom of God. He sees. He sees. He knew you before you were ever born. And he knows 
and become. And he's got a plan. His plan is for good and not for evil for you. I want to look at Psalms chapter 34, verse 18. This is a truth. This is, this is God's word. God's word never returns void. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I'm telling you, things happen in life that will crush you, that will break you down. We've had two friends die this week. One of them, a precious lady in Queens. And, man, I tell you what, I love Kathy. Kathy Tallman, Pam's sister-in-law. Special woman. She was really, really a special woman. She was a woman of God. She was like the person that takes care of the Queen's United Methodist Church there, all, does the finances, and you know, every time you went to a dinner or anything there, she was there and, and smiling and, and serving and, and happy. And uh, back when, when I was pastoring over in, in Weston, uh, the women had a, had a conference there. They had food as women's, women do and had a speaker and and uh, a whole bunch of women came to it from other churches. My mom brought uh, Della May and Kathy, and, and uh, Kathy was filled with the Holy Spirit in that, in that uh, time together with the ladies there. You know, today she's in the presence of the Lord. I don't grieve for her not one bit. I grieve for her husband, Tom. Yeah, I do. He needs prayer. He's, he's broken. He's been broken. He's broken. Because life has dealt him a blow. And I've got another friend who died the same day. His wife is broken right now. And life will do that to you. In 1947, Robert Pierce worked for a religious nonprofit organization called Youth for Christ. Its mission was to evangelize the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a big mission, isn't it? We're all a part of that, by the way. Yeah. This young evangelist started towards China with only enough money to buy a ticket to Honolulu. <laughs> that don't get you to China. So I, I think he was probably relying on the Lord. <laughs> so on the trip, he met Tina Hulkdoer, a teacher. She introduced him to a battered and abandoned child named White Jade. Unable to care for the child herself, she asked Pierce, what are you going to do about her? <laughs> Man, I'm trying to get to China. This was not my problem until I showed up here. Well, guess what? <laughs> the Holy Spirit broke him. Like right there, right then. Pierce gave the woman his last $5. Reached in his wallet and cleaned it out. Gave her the last $5. And he agreed to send the same amount each month to help the woman care for the child. You know, back then, $5 was worth a whole lot more than it is now. Yeah. Pierce eventually made it to China because, you know, we serve a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And you can start out to do something, and, and if he's called you to it, he will fund it. So he got him there, of course, where thousands made public commitments as followers of Christ during four months of evangelistic rallies. Awesome! Awesome. And while he was there, Pierce saw widespread hunger. He felt intense compassion for these people. Wow, God will do that. He puts you in a place and a time with people that have a need and 
Who else is he going to use? Like he sent Jesus to go on the cross. He's done, he's done what he needed to do. Who's he going to use today to meet the needs that, that he has? His people. Put him in this place. Yeah. Put him in this place. Pierce later wrote these words in the flyleaf of his Bible. Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. Let me say that again. Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. That's the kind of breaking that we need in our life. That's the kind of breaking we need in our life. Dragging a movie camera across Asia, China was soon closed. Pierce showed the resulting pictures to church audiences in North America. He asked for money to help children. He showed their faces and begged Christians to adopt one. In 1950, he incorporated this personal crusade to an organization that still is doing this work today, World Vision. Yeah. That's what one broken man, broken for the Lord, can do. And the thing is, he's got an army of broken people that he's using in the world today in so many different ways. Join God's broken people army. Join him. Yeah. You know, journalists even said that he was one of the most natural, uncontrollably honest men that they had ever met because he had been broken by the Lord. He wasn't in this for greed. He wasn't in it for money. He wasn't in it for self. We got to set ourselves aside. When it comes to the things of God and what he's trying to get us to do, it's not about a man. It's not whose name is up there on the marquee. It's not. The Lord is the one. Whew. Bob Pierce functioned from a broken heart, broken by God. The prophet Jeremiah, like Bob Pierce, served with a broken heart. He was called the weeping prophet because his heart broke over the plight and condition of his people. His heart ached. As challenging as Bob Pierce's work was to raise money to support needy children, Jeremiah's ministry was even more difficult. He was sent to deliver a hard message, a message that required people to repent, which is always a hard message, change and alter their lives, which is something that people don't naturally want to do. Let's just say it like it is. We don't like change. Like 99.9% .9 of people do not like change. My wife is not that way. Take, take my word for it. She loves change. She likes chaos and change and whatever. Most people are not like that. They don't want any part of that. Pastor John's like me. I'm not like that. I'm the opposite. <sighs> People do not respond well to personal messages that require behavioral changes. But guess what? You're getting one of those messages today. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm saying what God is telling me to say. And you need to be broken for God. You need to change your ways. You need to not just talk about repenting. You need to repent. You need to surrender. You need broken for God. You need to change. I need to change. We need to let this altar change us today. Wow. You know, the typical response when you give somebody a message like that is, who are you to tell me what to do? Your kids ever tell you that? 
I'm your dad. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> that used to carry more weight, I think. Who are you to tell me what to do? Jeremiah proclaimed this message, and he did it with a tear in his eye. Jeremiah's mourning prefigured Jesus. You see, Jesus had that same heart. He wept for his people. You know, the most powerful, shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. <sighs> Jesus is the king. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the captain of the Lord's host. Jesus doesn't have to cry, but he does. You know, he's at the right hand of the Father right now, interceding. He's interceding for you and for me. He's interceding for us. <sighs> yeah. What breaks your heart? I'm going to challenge you today. What breaks your heart? You know, what broke Jeremiah's heart? What broke Jesus' heart? These are the things that should break our heart. Number one, are we broken by sin? You know, people that sin as a way of life, <laughs> they just do it. I was there. You just do it. You, you sin. That's, that's, just, that's your life. You sin. And it doesn't bother you. It all rolls off your back like water off a duck's back. You just sin and keep on sinning. And the whole time it's grinding you down. The way of a transgressor is hard. Don't tell me how wonderful that life is. Don't tell me how, how much you were happy in that kind of life. When you got alone, yeah, it weighed on you because the way of a transgressor, a sinner, is hard. You're not full of me. I've been a sinner. Whew. I want to read Jeremiah 8, 5. Why has this people slidden back? Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. You get caught up in this cycle. Maybe you're here today and you're caught up in this cycle. Yeah. I can't change my life. I can't get rid of this, this sin. Sins become comfortable. They can. You've got to give it to God. You know, it, those kind of things come to a point where you just can't do it yourself. Man, you can quit smoking if you just put it down and not smoke anymore. You can quit drinking if you pour the last of it down the drain and you just don't, don't drink anymore. Yeah, right, it's that easy, huh? You know what? You need God to help you. Because I know lots of people who God has helped. And I'm just picking on a couple of things right there. There is lots of sins that get a hold of us that you can't get rid of by yourself. you got to have God helping you, and he will. If you get broken, if you go to his feet, if like Jacob, you grab hold of him and say, I'm not letting go till I am healed of this, till I am made right, till I am made whole. I'm telling you what, until you do that, you're not serious about it. You're not serious about it. 
Yeah, the people in Jeremiah's day had turned away from God. They refused to repent. They had no desire to return to God, though they had every opportunity to do so. Instead, the people deliberately charged ahead in their sinful practices like a war horse. Yeah. People are doing that in our day and age today. We live in the most wicked time right now. You read, you read in the Bible about the wicked times of old. We're right in the midst of it. We're worse because there's more people today. They should have known better. Jeremiah reminded them that when people fall down, they need to get back up. If one takes the wrong road, you turn around and get on the right road. Even birds know when it's time to migrate. They do. Sometimes they just come in masses. You ever notice that? It's going to be happening soon. Spring is coming. There's the, there's the good message for today. Spring is coming. I'm telling you, no matter what season you're in right now, the next good season is coming. It's coming. And spring is coming. Spring is coming. And the birds will be coming back. And they'll be coming back in mass, just flocks and flocks of birds. Because they know. If only people were as obedient in returning to God as birds are in returning in the springtime. One of the great problems in modern Christianity is that people profess the confession of sin, but not repentance. Yeah, it's not a one-time thing. Jesus wants us just to, not just to acknowledge our sin, but to turn from our sin. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big step when you acknowledge your sin, right? It's a big step. But that's not the last step. The last step is turning around from it and going the other way. That's the step. You got to remember what Jesus said to people. All the ones that he forgave, what did he say? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. You know what? Sounds easy, doesn't it? I didn't say it was easy, but is it possible? Is it possible to live a different life? Yes, it is, or Jesus wouldn't have said it. He wouldn't have said it if it wasn't possible. <clears throat> We're like children caught in misbehavior saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> only to turn around and do the same thing. We do the same thing with God. Number two, is our heart broken by God's word? If you're not reading God's word, you're messing up. You need to read God's word. It's life. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It will cut that stuff out of your life. <laughs> you can't get it out of your life if you don't know what it is. Read God's word. Get up in the morning and read it. Read it. Before you lay your head down at night. Read it sometime during the day. Read it. Read it. Man, we got so many ways to read God's word today. I've got two versions of the Bible on my cell phone. I got Bibles galore at home. It's on my laptop. The word is up. You can Google up any verse in the Bible and have it that quick. You can say Matthew chapter 1. Boom, the whole chapter is right there for you to read. If you don't have a Bible on your phone, it, it is on your phone. <clears throat> Jeremiah 
Chapter 8, verse 9 says, The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? These people possess the word. They just didn't practice the word. You not only have to possess the word, you have to practice the word. You can't just be a seer, you have to be a doer. Wow. You know, year in and year out, what do you think the most best-selling book is in the world? The Bible. There's still more copies of the Bible being sold every year in the, in the world. I mean, we're not Bible poor in the world. We really aren't. There's so many organizations even giving out free Bibles. Wow. But its popularity is not keeping American society from crumbling morally and spiritually. There appears to be little connection between what people say and what they believe. Wow. Between what they believe and how they act. There's such a big gap between those things. because we don't practice it. And it broke Jesus' hearts that the scribes and the Pharisees that were students of the word in his time did not practice the word. He said, you hypocrites, you know it, but you don't do it. <sighs> to accept God's word, we first must welcome the word into our lives. I tell you what, it's, you gotta settle this. Do you believe every word that the Bible says is truth? If you don't, you need to settle that. There's other very educated people in this room. And I've got a bachelor's degree from WVU and a master's degree from Penn State. I've got years and years and years of other, other studying that I've done ministerial study. I've got years of that. But I'm going to tell you what. I am just simple enough to believe everything that God's Word said. My mom told me when I was little that everything in that Bible was true. And guess what? I believed her. And the Holy Spirit has emphasized that in my life from the time I was little. That His Word is true. And I've seen it come forth and the truth prevail. It's true. Don't let anybody talk you out of any part of that Bible. Right. Not any part. Whew. That Bible will change your life. It will change your heart. It will break you if you just let it. It will cause you to be sensitive to the disfranchised, the lonely, the abused, the neglected. It will cause you to cry out for the lost. It will give you the passion of Jesus for the world if you just read it and let it, let it get into your heart. Number three is our heart broken by realizing the urgency of the hour. Do you know what hour we live in? I'm telling you what, we are in the very last days of time. We don't have much time. Is your heart broken by how late in the game we are? We're in the first, we're in the fourth. We're in the fourth. And I'm telling you what, the clock is ticking off the last seconds. We don't have much time left. We got to be broken by the people that are around us. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20 says, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. The harvest and the summer were two different seasons. The former was the time for gathering grain, the latter was the time for gathering fruit. 
one of these harvests was a failure, they still had success because they had the other one to fall back on. If both were a failure, guess what? They starved. You know what? Our grocery stores can empty out real quick too. Have you noticed that? If you're relying on the government, if you're relying on our grocery store system, if you're relying on, on your paycheck, i tell you what, you're relying on the wrong things. Amen. You've got to get a hold of God because he's your source. Yes. Of the billions of people in the world, it's estimated that over 30 million worldwide will die without Christ each year. Now, if that doesn't break you, what does? 30 million people are dying without Jesus Christ and going to hell every single year. 30 million. <sighs> wow. There are so many people in America. They don't go to church at Easter. They don't go to church on Christmas. They don't even go to weddings or funerals because they don't want to go into church. And if they were to die, they would go to hell. Eternal punishment without knowing the love of Christ. I'm telling you what, yeah, I said that word, hell. Just as, just as sure as there's a heaven, there is a hell. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There is heaven, yes. And unlike a lot of preachers, I'm going to tell you this, everybody's going to heaven. Oh, blasphemy. No, everybody's going to heaven. Everybody is. Everybody's going to know what heaven's like because they're going to go there. The great white throne judgment, they're all going to be there. But the problem is there's a whole bunch of people that aren't going to get to stay. <laughs> Can you imagine seeing the splendor of heaven? Going down Heaven's Avenue, seeing the trees of life and the river of life, seeing the throne of God, seeing Jesus, and being told, your name's not in the book of life, and you're going into utter darkness. No, I can't even imagine what that would be like. My heart is broken just thinking of people standing there knowing, seeing what heaven's splendor is, and knowing that they're not going to get to stay for all of eternity. There's no second chance at this. That's it. The time to do something about it is right now. Your family, your neighbor, your coworker, yes. the time to reach them is now. Yes. Yes. We're living in desperate times. <sighs> Number four is, is your heart broken by watching someone self-destruct? People self-destruct. <laughs> Man, have I watched that. Talk about heartbreaking. What if you're a parent and that's your son or your daughter that does that? I mean, you know how they can get out of what they're doing, and they just won't do it. They just self-destruct. That breaks my heart. It doesn't have to be part of my family. It just breaks my heart to see people self-destruct, having a way out and just won't, won't do it. Wow. Wow. Jeremiah 8, 21 says, For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment. That's translated in the Hebrew as horror, by the way. It's not astonishment in a good way. Horror has taken hold of me. That's how Jeremiah felt when he saw people self-destructing. And that's how you and I ought to take it too. Whew. Jeremiah mourned over the sins of his people. 
Jesus, too, saw the world in the same way. You know, on the, when, he, when he took on the burden of sin of the world, his very sweat was blood. That's how, that's how he agonized over the sins of the world. You get the word excruciating. Anybody ever had excruciating pain? If you haven't, I'll tell you what, <laughs> you've missed out. <laughs> I've had excruciating pain at least three times in my life. And I mean to the point where you just like, okay, turn the morphine drip on. No! <laughs> like it really, really hurt. Excruciating. The word comes from the events at Calvary. The word means out of the cross. That's what the word excruciating means. You know, no matter how excruciating pain is that we've had, it doesn't compare to what Jesus went through. Whew. The pain, the hurt, the emotions ran deep. Yeah. And the people were running headlong into destruction the, the whole time. <sighs> Number five, does our heart break because the people refuse the cure? We touched on that a little bit. People will have the cure and refuse it. Have you ever known anybody that wouldn't take medicine when they're, when they're sick or whatever? We had a beloved friend, beloved, that would not take blood pressure medicine. He had high blood pressure. Would not take it, would not go to the doctor. And he died of a brain aneurysm. Yeah, he stayed up late working on something on his desk and his wife got up at four in the morning and there he was, leaned over his desk, died just like that instantly. To me, it's so sad because all he had to do was take his blood pressure medicine. You know, when he got to heaven, Jesus said, you know, I raised this doctor up from a little boy. I raised him up, and I brought him to Buck Hannon. And I had him in place to take care of you. And you wouldn't go see him. And I caused these, these, these chemists and, and, and drug companies to be able to develop this one special blood pressure medicine that would have took care of everything for you and you wouldn't take it. So you're here early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we live in a truly wonderful time today when it comes to medical science. And doctors have their place. And I believe in faith. The first thing I want is somebody to pray for me. I want people of faith to pray for me. But you know, God just may have put them doctors and that medicine there for this time and place. And so, you know, he worked in so many different ways. Would you have ever thought to spit in on a bunch of dust on the ground and make mud and rub it into somebody's eyes to heal their eyes? Man, I'd have never thought of that. Of all the things, I, I would have never thought of that. But that's what he did. There's lots of different ways that God uses to heal us. Yeah. We'll leave that, that horse lie. But anyways, uh, Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 22 said, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? You know, that's a metaphor that those people would have understood. And this, this balm of Gilead, I mean, that's just got a wonderful ring to it, doesn't it? 
the balm of Gilead. Like you, you got, got a problem, you got a bum shoulder, rub some balm of Gilead on it. You know, way better than being gay. Balm of Gilead. Yeah, I love it. You know, this was a, was a tree, and, you know, I don't know what tree it was, and I don't think anybody knows what tree it was, but, you know, God put the plants there. Did you know that most medicines are not chemically made? They come from plants. I mean, I, I have a friend who's, who's actually a chemist, and that's what she does. She goes and collects plants and, and, and at work, and, and they, they, they do all these different things to try to extract something that's helpful in some way. And, and she studies the Indians. The Indians had all kinds of, of herbal and, and whatever things that they used. Aspirin comes from the bark of a willow tree, by the way. Uh, but aloe vera that you put on burns, that's a plant. And you use the sap. I mean, there's, there's just like millions of, of things in nature that can be used. Yeah, this uh, balm of Gilead was gathered in the mountainous region east of the Jordan River and north of Moab. Yeah, 